I think we will we will begin. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto. And we will start with a karakia. And this, this particular karakia uh, speaks of being in this gathering, seek knowledge for understanding, have purpose in all you do, stand tall, be strong, let's show respect for each other. Etefano hui, fire te mata ranga kia marama. Kia fai take nga mahi katoa. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato ia tato katoa. I'm Joanna Santa Barbara, and I'm co chair of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum. The forum is a community group for urgent action on climate change. And we're collaborating with Tasman Environmental Trust who lead work to protect and restore our natural heritage. And we see these two things as, as going closely together. Um, let me introduce our co-host, David Bartle. Um, who is also a highly active member of, of the Climate Forum. And we're running these online Meet the Candidate events because we see it as vital for our local councillors to take effective climate action. This is a crucial three years as we approach the 2030 milestone by which we've agreed to almost halve our emissions and in which we must start the, the adaptation process and respond to the biodiversity crisis. We're eager to see how you as candidates handle this unprecedented challenge to those who wish to be governance leaders in this region. And we thank you for standing for public office. I want to have a few words about procedure tonight and just repeating our request to mute yourselves, please. Um, Jeff DeBecca, um, please mute yourself. <clears throat> so our session will run until 8.30 and roughly two thirds of it will be spent on questions which have been elicited from members of the Climate Forum Forest and Bird, Nelson Tasman and Tasman Environmental Trust. So Nelson Tasman 2050 and Tasman Environmental Trust. Candidates have received these questions beforehand and each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the question. We're going to be strict with time, I'm afraid. Um, we we uh, need everyone to have a fair go, and therefore we have to be strict with time. So when you hear a firm time's up, uh, you need to stop. <laughs> um, and I, I'm sure you'll understand why we need to be a bit tough about this. We ask you to keep to the point and respect the fact that participants have joined because they want to hear your views on climate and biodiversity on this evening. And it's okay to pass if you don't wish to address a question. Then the remaining third of the time will be spent on questions from the floor. Please type your questions into the chat box and we'll pick them up from there. And please forgive us in advance if we don't manage to cover all of the questions. Um, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time through this session. And the chat box is at the bottom of your screen, um, kind of in the middle. <clears throat> um, so tonight, the candidates who, who are present are Mike Harvey, just wave, wave your hand, so thank you. And um, Richard Osmiston, right? Uh, Maxwell Clark and Ali Cook. Okay, and as I said, we're expecting Tim King, perhaps he'll come in a little late. 
Excuse me, Joanna. Yeah, I'm just in contact with Tim. He says he can't get in. Would Would you be able to resend him the newer link? I'm not sure. I can find him. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, David. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and just to let you know that that um, as you can see in the upper left corner, we are recording this session, and we plan to put it up on our website. <clears throat> so, um, the first question is, is an introductory question, and we want you to tell us who you are and what are your outstanding credentials. Oh, sorry. Um, what, what are your outstanding credentials in the arena of climate change? And we'll start with Mike Harvey and Mike this is this is two minutes for this question. Mike, you're muted. Unmute yourself, please. We'll, we'll start the two minutes after you unmute mm -hmm. yourself. Just before we start, Joanna, do, we, do, do I need to email the address to Tim? Do we have his email address handy? Um, oh, can any other councillor give the standard council email address? I, um, I, I just I, I just emailed and texted him. Thanks, oh. Jenny. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mike, off you go. Right. Okay, here we go. Mike Harvey, mayoral candidate for Tasman District. My outstanding credentials for the environment. Um, many people in Nelson and Tasman region will not be aware of the commitment that my wife and I have made in 2018 to causing permanent change in an industry that repeatedly engaged in crimes against the environment. It's been said, ring the bells that can be rung, forget your perfect offering, for there is a crack in everything, and that is how the light comes in. After 18 years in real estate, we had a medical event in our family, and our five-month-old daughter suddenly became very unwell, and the pressure of managing family, managing my real estate business and real estate interests was the pressure that caused a fracture in my thinking. And that's when the light got in. And I saw the extraordinarily unnecessary impact and cost of the real estate industry's market on both the environment and the pocket of homeowners. And that was pre-COVID, so um, pre-COVID 2018. As soon as my daughter got well, my wife and I refocused our attention on eliminating unnecessary real estate marketing material from our environment. We completely stripped down the way property is marketed and the question kept coming up, why not Tinder for real estate? just connect buyers and sellers directly let the agents do all the negotiation so that's exactly what we did we backed away from real estate sales in 2018 and marketing and we we owned green or we, we closed it down to make way for the system and we invested in the future and developing a comprehensive real estate marketing system that can be used by every agent every homeowner because we believe systems or systems like ours have the power to take away the crime of core flute signs print media massive unnecessary agent vehicle movements all weekend long. And we know that's a big offender in Tasman vehicles. So my wife and I consider that we have done more than just talk about what we're gonna do. We've actually demonstrated our commitment to the environment and to our children's future through our sustained focus over four years of development and significant investment in building the technology. It's now live, it's available, and we believe that's our contribution to the future of the environment. Thank you, Mike. You were just two minutes. Thanks a lot. Was that not two minutes? That was two minutes. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Richard Osniston, can you yeah, go for that you. question? Who you are and what are your credentials in environment action? Right. Thanks very much, Joanna and David. This is a magnificent show you're putting on here. This is the 18th. <laughs> Uh, meet the candidate event I've been to in the last fortnight and uh, I'm having a pretty good time actually. We seem to finally be getting some traction. So my name is Richard Osmiston and uh, I'm the leader and founder of the New Zealand Money Free Party and we've contested three general elections and this is our fourth local election cycle standing for mayoral and councillor positions. Um, we obviously are about the uh, abolishment, the abandonment of the monetary system itself because we see that as the root cause of, in fact, all our climate problems and in fact, all our other problems as well. And all the time we are walking around with to be ever more sophisticated band-aids, we are still not gonna stop the root cause of all these you know, extreme crisis issues that 
I have not seen a single thing in 10 years of activism and research and campaigning that has changed the course of our society. And uh, I had a very interesting, very full and frank open discussion with Minister, ex-Minister Nick Smith this afternoon in Nelson, who was proudly trumping his 30 years of parliamentarism, which I just couldn't stomach, so I had to speak up. But um, <laughs> my outstanding credentials, I'm, I'm somewhat ashamed to say I flew a McDonnell Douglas DC-10 for five years and before that a Boeing 707 all over the world, and we consumed enormous quantities of jet fuel and ejected them into the upper atmosphere. So uh, that's probably my most extant, outstanding credential. However, um, this term I'm running for six mayoralties around the top of the South from Marlborough to Westland. And the reason I'm doing that is to attempt to elevate the conversation into the most critical areas, which traditionally at least, um, this doesn't seem to be a feature of conventional government. We haven't made a huge amount of progress in the general election processes. And local government seems to be literally bogged down. I mean, crippled by banalities. Time, they're, they're time's up. Time is time's up. up. Yes, sorry. <laughs> we, we need to change the system, Joanna. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Um, so on to Maxwell Clark. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you very much for the evening. Uh, Maxwell Clark, I, um, I'd just like to talk about something I've actually done something, uh, in this, this environment area. We uh, own a lagoon, the only uh, natural lagoon in the Waimea estuary. And uh, for a number of years ago, we've always decided we will protect that for everyone's benefit, both the community and, and the future. So what we did is uh, our neighbours uh, filled their, their lagoons in. We were left ours on its own entire, entirety. They, um, we planted out native um, uh, flaxes and trees around it. We fenced off the area. The, there's a walkway and cycleway that runs through the, through the seaside of, the, the, of our property there. But what we've done is protected the micro diversity with fungies and bacterial type things, which are, are very important in the, um, in the biodiversity area. Tiny things that you cannot see. We, have, we lifted the uh, walk, walkway off, off the ground so that, it, so that the tide could come and go on and make it uh, quite a comfortable environment. And the native birds and are flourishing down there in the ecosystem there. And we're so pleased that we are able to, to do this for our own benefit and the community's benefit. It's something that people in the, in the very uh, not so distant future have always uh, filled in. Uh, for, for their own gains, whether it's for farming and that, I think we need to protect these environments. Uh, my background is um, I live in Richmond. I uh, own an ambulance company. I'm a critical care paramedic and a, and a registered nurse. I have a caring feeling about the community, not only just um, in health, things generally. And that's about all I'd like to say at this point in time. And thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much, Maxwell. Um, and now we go to Ali Cook. Kia ora mai, uh, tapau tēnā katoa. Uh, greetings to you all. Uh, my name is Ali Cook. Uh, I have lived in Kina, spray free and fertilizer free for 30 years. I am a vegan and I don't drive a car by choice. Um, and so I make personal choices about the environment. Um, uh, with the outdoors party, so I carry our values for the environment. So I have been outspoken about 1080, which some people won't like, but um, I'm also outspoken about glyphosates, which some people will like in here. Um, I'm a mother, a wife, a recording artist, a self-employed publicist and promoter for over 40 years. Uh, I am twice nominated Next Magazine New Zealand Woman of the Year in 2011 and 2016 for my contribution to the arts. And my work has taken me out of the region a lot. Um, I've worked on multi-million dollar tours like Bolshoi Ballet and Andrea Bocelli, which teaches you teamwork and staying on budget. I did eight years in luxury property development in Tasman and I've opposed some developments as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, my climate change action is, is um, from within me coming out so, um, by, my own, by my own choices. Um, I've alerted CDCs to tip sites that have gone on to be capped. And um, yeah, that's, that's basically me. I'm ready to answer the questions. 
Thank, thank you very much, Ali. Um, and, and now Tim King. Tim, I'm so sorry you had difficulty getting on and I'm very pleased that you are on, even though you're under the name of Joni Tomsett, um, which you can, you can change. Um, uh, that's, if, that's if right. I'm, sure, I'm sure people will figure out the difference from me and Joni and um, just thanks for her to send the revised link through. So apologies for the technical incompetence. No, not at all. We're happy to have you here. And so now we'll, we'll put the question to you. Tell us who you are um, and your outstanding credentials in the arena of action on climate and biodiversity. And thanks very much, firstly, for the opportunity. Uh, my name's Tim King. Our family farm in the Eves Valley off the side of the Waimea Plains. We have three sons, all farming in different locations around the South Island. Uh, so after traveling and living overseas after leaving school, I returned to this region uh, where I've been ever since uh, and uh, worked in the farming and forestry industries. Got a governance experience across a range of both businesses and community organizations spanning infrastructure development, tourism, health, emergency management, sport and recreation, and a few years in local government. All the challenges that we face over the next three years and into the future, from resilience to extreme weather events, emissions reduction, housing, growth, water quality, biodiversity, have one thing in common. They're only going to be able to be so, uh, solved collectively, working with industries, NGOs, iwi, central government, um, and communities, uh, and a willingness to compromise and a willingness and an acceptance that sometimes getting good outcomes that are actually achievable is better than waiting for perfect outcomes that always remain out of reach. Um, I, I don't claim to have an outstanding um, oh, history in the um, biodiversity or climate change, but what I have done in my own life on our own farm, we've done a huge amount of planting um, and we try and, and food production, I think is a really critical part of our, of, and I, I love being part of food production. I've been proud to be part of the biodiversity strategy development at the council the bringing in and the implementation of our climate action plan and supporting the investment in the significant investment that's going into active and public transport over the next 10 years. So that's me, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and now I'll pass to um, our co-host, David Bartle, with, with apologies, David, because I realize I jumped in and did the timekeeping. Um, no, oh, it's good. We're going well. So okay. I'm, I'll do I'm, I'm trying to assist Joanna on this. So this isn't that great. And we're all a nice extended family here tonight. So I, I'm going to ask the next question. We're going to change the order slightly of the candidates when we ask them. Uh, and so, but before I pose the question, I want to remind everybody to use the chat box if you have a question, and then we'll select some from those questions. The questions that could be put to all the candidates would be really helpful. So you can use the chat box anytime. So Richard, I'm going to ask you the first question that we circulated beyond the introductory. And this is, um, uh, this, we said that the climate crisis requires urgent and significant change in how we live. Can you describe a climate relevant change that you would launch through the council in the next three years would help us change how we live? Could be waste, could be intensification, could be energy. Do, could you tell us one of, something that you would like to change? Yep, how long have we got, David? Two minutes, the whole world's sorted in that time, please. <laughs> Piece of cake, two minutes. <laughs> After 10 years of research and promotion and activism, and <clears throat> bearing in mind my background is in farming originally and then aviation and engineering, um, <laughs> our, our philosophy has always been, if you don't know, ask. And so with these difficult questions about the economy and how we seem to be stuck, you know, completely hamstrung with economics, and we have got through all the technical and the scientific hurdles, but we just can't seem to apply them. It seems to be an almost impossible uphill battle. We concluded that the, the money system was at the root of it, and thus having gone with that concept to an, a vast audience, mostly most positive with young people, actually, um, we are very firmly of the belief that if we do 
abandon the monetary system, adopt a resource-based economy, which is very well developed, make everything free and everything voluntary, then essentially the climate issues a, will cease to be continuously accelerated, which is what we've seen in all our lifetimes, and the solutions will actually come automatically. It may take a little bit longer, and I invite people to visit our website and look up resource-based economy on the internet, and you'll have a field day. Welcome to the rabbit hole. Thank but you. Essentially, the monetary system is what's driving it, and it's what's stopping us fixing it. Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. I say, thanks, uh, Richard, rather. So, uh, Maxwell, I want to ask you the same question. So, uh, if you were elected mayor, what would you do to launch in the council a climate relevant change of significance? What would you do? Well, I, I think food waste is a problem. I think it's uh, generally that food is uh, sent to the landfill, uh, it produces <coughs> methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas that's more potentially, uh, has more potency, rather, big fun, than CO2 and also the packaging that goes with those sort of uh, products that we're putting out there. Methane, of course, is uh, used in the Nelson tip at present for the heating for the Nelson Hospital, but it's still a very toxic gas. What I would like to do is put an education program, and it does start from the council's uh, uh, position, starting with the most important things. And you could say buy food less, and people will say, what are you talking about? Well, I think you can grow food. There's a lot more food than what currently is done. I think you can plan meals, you can freeze food, you can look at leftovers and, and grow, grow your own food wherever possible. Organic waste, in my view, should be, should be made to be compost in its own bin and uh, used as a compost on your own property. Uh, spare food like, like vegetables and such like can be shared with neighbours. And it's not unheard of to have community gardens where we can encourage people to join in together and do those types of things. That would be what I would, first of all, think about. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ali, the same question for you. What would you do? Uh, what sort of climate relevant change would you launch through the council once you were elected mayor? I think one of the most important things going forward is going to be education, education of the public and education of farmers. Because, I mean, nitrate levels on the Waimea Plains aren't that great. Um, and... Agriculture accounts for 50% of greenhouse gas emissions in New Zealand. Nitrous oxide, um, which is released from nitrogen fertilisers, um, has 298 times the warming power of CO2. So I would like to see um, us promote regenerative and organic farming, and that may mean education of, of farmers to encourage them to do that, because that's what they're doing in the US. Um, so that people get a, a, a better soil going on because of the sequestration that you get from having a better soil. Um, so that's what, yeah, I think it's education based. The other thing is too was, I'll cover that in transport, but it's going to be, we're going to be putting public transport in, but I think again, it's education and encouragement to make the public use it. That'll be the greater challenge. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mike? Your, your response, please. Can I repeat the question? Sorry, mate. I just had to uh, turn it off. Mate. Yeah. Okay, right. So I actually think that something that we can do within the council is change the attitude around the table, the planning table, around the council table. And we need to shift that attitude from one, which is residual. And it was residual in all green technology. That is one that says that green technology is not really that affordable and green technology isn't quite as good and all of that stuff. And there's a, a bit of a belief of all of those things. And so in my view, we need to have it included in the planning around the table. We need to, with a better commitment to actually bring it all the way through the project. I feel sometimes it's just included or often it's included a bit like to tick all the boxes, but as it goes through the project, get the other end. And often I feel what's, what's paid the price through the project is the environmental aspect of it. Yeah, and I want to see that become a more realistic um, endeavour rather than just lip service. So that's what I think we need to change. And that's something we can change within the council. We can encourage people to bring alternative solutions to the council with their planning and we can be a lot more open to it. We can get away from all the brands. You can't touch this. You can't touch that. That's just central government legislation. We need to start working locally. And that's where we need to start fixing the environment is locally. So that's what I'm all about. 
Thanks a lot. Uh, Tim, what climate change what what climate change initiative would you launch through the council in the next three years beyond what you've been doing? Right, well, I think the key thing I'll preface you know my way. I think there is I think there's going to need to be change right across the spectrum in terms of waste, energy, transport, et cetera. But the one change that I'd really like to investigate and, and try and get through in the next council term is to work with Nelson City Council and uh, using some of the potential money that we get from central government um, in relation to possible changes around three waters uh, to aggregate land, particularly in areas where uh, redevelopment is an option. One of the big challenges is how do you get sufficient land aggregated up to enable uh, redevelopment to happen at a high quality. Um, so I don't propose necessarily that councils should do the redevelopment. I think that's often better done by the market, but by aggregating up the land and then putting in place the vision that you'd like to see, uh, I think that's a space that councils can be much more active in. That would be a new area of work for the council. It would. Right, Joanna, I'm going to pass back to you. Okie doke. Um, the next question is about transport, uh, and it's pretty a pretty important one because about 90% of our local carbon dioxide emissions are from transport. Uh, what will you specifically do to help reduce transport emissions, building on what TDC has done so far? And we will start in this case uh, with Tim. Right, well, again, like I said earlier, it's one of the things that I've been really um, happy to be involved with it is the development of the public transport extensions which were announced the other day and I think that is something that we'll have to continue to look to improve hopefully through education um, and if the public really gets on board then increasing the frequency of those new public um, transport services out to the motorwakers, the Marpuas, the Tasmans, the Brightwater and the Wakefields will be a real focus as will accelerating the investment in the active transport network. There's an opportunity uh, I know not everyone agrees with the, um, the preferences of the current government, but at the moment they are putting a lot of funding into active transport investment and taking advantage of that over the next um, 18 months will be criti critically important. So we can accelerate the quite ambitious plans that are already in place uh, for an active transport network around our major urban areas, and that's both walking and cycling. I think the other key thing is while focusing on the actual transport itself, trying to minimise the need for people to use transport so that as new communities develop or redevelop in existing communities, we ensure that the services and facilities are located close enough so that people can access them without necessarily having to either use public transport um, or need to drive. Thank you, Tim. And now, now going to Richard uh, for the same question. Uh, what will you specifically do if elected to help reduce transport emissions, building on what TDC has already done? Yep, and I actually think they're doing a great job. You know, we started with barbarism and uh, we are in the age of enlightenment for want of a better expression. So it's a, tr it's a tiny, but we are an emergent species. And uh, the, what we have learned in our lifetimes is more than enough to make the changes that we need, but we do have to start to look a bit further outside the box than we have done historically because the answers are not there. And as an example, um, you know, electrification, as we now know, brings all kinds of other problems, doesn't it? Manufacturing, mining, etc. Um, and so when we reconsider the resource-based economy, the one we're promoting without money, without trade, barter, currency, all those traditional hierarchical exploitive activities actually, and look at what the structure and the shape of a voluntary society would be like, when everything is voluntary, many jobs that we currently do today that we call our portal to life, you know, if you don't have a job, then it doesn't allow you to have a life, which has all kinds of problems with it. 
Um, not the least of mentioning technology and employment because we're getting better and better at producing the things that we need. Most of our journeys are actually unnecessary. Thank you. Really, most people want to stay at home. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. On to Maxwell Clark with the same question. Thank you. Um, I'd invest in renewable energy. I think we need to change away from our energy sources to clean renewable energy. And the best way, of course, is to stop using fo fossil fuels. I would start with the council's uh, fleet vehicles. And I'd suggest that, uh, that within three years, you can get 40% of them to be electric cars or, or a mixture of both. I would like to improve the bus service for transportation for the community, especially when you consider the petrol prices. It's a, I think it's a good time to educate people to use the bus. And the other consideration is 33% of all TDC ratepayers in the next few years will be over 65 years of age. What we need to do with the bus service is make it fit for purpose. So what I'm saying by that is you don't need to take a bus service that goes from Nelson to, uh, to Richmond. You need to take the bus service that goes around the local community, perhaps to the mall, the doctor services, and come back in a circuitry thing back to the home. I especially would like to talk about gridlock. I think it's particularly bad in Richmond. It's held up at Queen Street traffic lights. It's not, and what I would propose is the council have currently got on their books uh, to put in a uh, traffic lights in the corner of Queen Street and Berryfield Drive. I would stop that immediately. It currently flows. The traffic comes out of there. The engineers designed a very well designed um, project about a year ago. The traffic comes out of Berryfield Drive, comes into a merging lane, and without any stopping either way, it goes, flows and mixes together. And what I would do at the Queen Street lights, where there's a real problem, I transfer those funds from these traffic lights to make a free turning without any traffic lights from coming up this directional sense. And you could do the very similar thing coming in from Wakefield. So instead of having gridlock where the traffic sits there and it pollutes the atmosphere, you'd have traffic that flowed constantly without any hesitation. And that would be my focus. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Ali Cook. Um, okay, so I think that, as again, education, I'm, I'm really, really pleased that the TDC are doing a, a electric bus um, fleet and doing outer regions. Uh, as a person that doesn't drive, that's often, like, for my example, I worked with a property developer, I used to sit right next to him as his PA, and people used to say, oh, she doesn't have a licence, doesn't that bother you that she doesn't drive? And he went, hell no, she sits on the laptop and does you know, between here and Nelson does, you know, five or six letters with me dictating. So, you know, I would like to see the public transport um, have carrots to it like that. Like we can plug our phone in when we go in the bus, we can go on the Wi-Fi, you know, things that actually make people want to take it. Um, and that may be considered parking uh, prices in Richmond, you know what I mean? It might take, might take that to actually make people want to take the bus instead. Um, and when you're taking a bus from an outlying area, having something to do while you're in it is good. Um, and having stops that are related to the groceries and places like that where people can actually actively use a bus ride into town and back. Um, so yeah, I think education, and I think we have to be mindful of the type of fuels going forward. Renewable energies is a growing thing. And so we have electric at the moment, but biofuels will come in the future, I think as well. So we have to look at what we're doing and the impacts of what that is. So we can't feel that good about electric because it's actually poisoning water with lithium mining in South America. Um, we can't feel that good about, you know, one thing if it's doing damage to the environment and the other. Another is AdBlue, uh, Ad which we're putting into diesel of trucks at the moment, which comes out of the exhaust pipe very close to ammonia and comes down off the road into waterways. So it has environmental impacts as well. So I think we have to look as the green energy, as we look to move away from fossil fuels to um, look at other impacts that the new energies are having as well. I think that's important and education will be number one to make people an encouragement to make people use the public transport that uh, Tasman District Council is providing. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. And Mike Harvey, same question. Un unmute yourself, Mike. Mike, unmute yourself. Oh, right. good. Um, 
good stuff. Okay, I, I, as a Richmond resident, I have a reasonable experience of the traffic around here, much like Maxwell, and I see what's going on. I see quite a bit of congestion. I see quite a, a lot of cars sitting there just idling away. And I understand that's a pretty bad time for the benzines and everything all to be getting out. So trying to reduce that idling is a specific thing that we do. I think that's possible. And the way that I think we can reduce that, a lot of those cars are coming into Richmond Centre to work. Like even the TDC, for example, there's a lot of stuff, 394 stuff. Now, they don't all work on the main street of Richmond, but there's a large proportion of them that do. And they have, they, most of them live out in Brightwater, you know, Marpua, Tasma, they live around the place. And so they have to drive in. And so they come driving into the TDC building, they come down Gladstone Road, you know, they get caught in the lights, they make their way up Queen Street, they walk into the building, they punch the clock, and then they walk out, hop in their car, they make their way all down Gladstone Road again and out to, the, out to the area of business, which is checking buildings and everything out there. So for a start, having the council buildings at, right there in that corner of our, our province where everybody has to make their way through, we could take 300 cars of council cars out straight away. That didn't need to come in to clock their time sheet and back out again. I believe that the way to do it, though, is to go to Lower Queen Street, set up a decent park and ride, and we could do this with buses to start, but I believe a really decent park and ride that has sort of a seven-minute turnaround and then give buses a priority lane, take them straight up to the... Why does it have to be the world's biggest network? Why can't it be two kilometres up and back, up and back, up and back, all day long? So that, you know, like I lived in Mapua for years, I would have jumped on the thing rather than sitting there in traffic all day long waiting to get to the Richmond Mall and back, you know? So I think there's a real possibility just to tangibly put a bus in, park and ride, get, a, get an area for people to park. So those are the two sorts of solutions in the short term that I see around the Richmond area alone. Thank you very much. Thanks, so, Mike. I have the next question now, Joanna. Uh, yes, over to you to, for the next question, David. Yes. So uh, just to keep our candidates on their toes, we've changed the question we circulated. Uh, so uh, because we felt it didn't quite hit the nail. And in fact, the question I'm going to ask is very similar to one that's in the chat regarding uh, what we use our land for. And so it relates to uh, planning new housing and so on. But it, there's two aspects to this that everybody here, I think, knows already. One of them is that uh, if we use our agricultural land for housing, it won't be available for that other purpose forever, probably. Uh, uh, but the second is it's very relevant to climate change because no. what you may not see raised excuse me, Stuart Bryant and Anne Dickinson, cool. please mute mute cool. your mics. Cool. 25. What sort of disruption is that going to cause? Stuart, Stuart Bryant, please mute yeah. your mic. Yeah. I'll carry on talking. Right. Oh. Uh, so uh, the, the, the second yeah. point is this that this region has an extraordinarily high uh, travel per person, kilometers per person, one of the highest in the world, this very region. So in order to address the, the problem of carbon use in our transport, we have to find a way for people to travel less, less distance. And we, we've had a recent uh, uh, future development strategy, which many, most of you know about. So my question is, what would you do to change the focus of our work to, to building more homes in town. What can we do to get more homes built in town? And uh, whether it be in uh, Richmond, in Motawaka, or in some of our other towns. So I, I'm going to start then with Maxwell, please. And oh, if you wouldn't you. mind, yes, about, yes. uh, you Thanks, Maxwell. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, you're, quite, you. you're quite correct. Uh, uh, urban planning is quite an important aspect of business. And I think they, there is an opportunity for this council to do higher density housing, to reduce traveling time. If you place people closer to their work, there's less likelihood of using transport needs. Uh, you can cycle or walk to work or get very handy. I think it's a great idea. Um, what, one of the things I think is, is also is affecting, uh, is changing people's uh, behavioral habits. I've done a survey of traffic coming past my place and I live in Lower Queen Street. I cannot believe that 75% of all traffic at peak times has got one and one only person in their vehicle. I think we, what we should do is, is come down with a bit more education. I think we should be prioritizing people who have got two or more people in their cars to get a, get a free lane or a priority lane. 
And, and, and quite honestly, uh, there's other alternative choices, like we need to look after our walkways and protect them. Most people, if they got a, a clean service and, and accessible from, the, from the, for their home to, to work, would use the cheaper form of transport, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ali, what would you do to get more houses built in town, greater intensification? What would you do to try to achieve that? Um, it's a difficult one because it's also where people want to live as well, obviously. But um, I think that intensification of like houses with or shops with, um, you know, uh, living a, above creates a vibrant town. So I think that that's a really good thing to do anyway. Um, if you go to a lot of places in Europe, you'll see that where there's little houses that are on top of all the shops and, you know, people come down and it's, it's, it just makes the whole town vibrant. Um, so I think, and also you've got the infrastructure there anyway. So um, having more, having encouraging more development in, in and around each little regional town would be kind of cool. And then um, out as far as being out in the greenfield developments, I would like to see more things like encouragement of um, organic community gardens, uh, you know, less use of glyphosates and sprays and uh, anything that's affecting the soil biome, that's affecting the se uh, sequestration of, of carbons as well. So it, there's a lot of work being done on that at the moment that I've been reading about. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, making those places, making like, um, you know, tiny homes for that to be like easier for people to actually do that kind of thing and have community gardens. Um, yeah, so a, a bit of a mix of both actually, I guess. Increase in the cities and making the outer living being more organic, if it were. Thank you. So Mike, uh, so the, the problem in the chat uh, has been identified as we're using some of our best agricultural land in Richmond South. So what would you do, Mike, to get more houses in town? Cool, okay. Uh, there was a study group put together in around about 2016 of local surveyors. So um, Paul Newton was definitely involved. I believe that Mark Lyle from um, Landmark Lyle was involved. So, you know, some real quality uh, private people involved in a study that both councils, um, you know, put together and ask them to do as to what they could do to encourage infill development. And these guys went through the full study and there was only one thing that was stopping infill development in their findings. And that was the costs of councils, fees and levies. It just made it not possible on a two or three lot subdivision. You know, you've got a house and you're taking one section off the back and so that you get one free, of course, because you have an existing house. So you have the existing reserve contributions, the existing development contributions, you, they have the benefit of that. But the second one, you must pay the development contributions and reserve contributions. And as Ali quite rightly pointed out, you know, people have to want to live there. And so, you know, if you start charging $65,000, and, and they're what I call backhanders and extortions, which the council likes to refer to as reserve contribution funds and development levies, but um, if you start forking out $65,000 just in backhanders and extortions alone, then that drives the price of those sections up. And next thing you know, it's a whole lot better value to buy in a greenfield subdivision. So council actually has to bite the bullet, suck a coomer on this one for the sake of the environment and start making it possible for people that own land in the middle of the town to develop it. That's what needs to happen. Thank you. Well, Tim, you've got some inside knowledge on this. What would you do? Uh, look, I think one of the crucial things is we have to make the system process easier to develop intensification. Look, it's been really good to see the amount of intensive development around central Richmond, uh, either done, partly done, or just starting out and having been consented. So I think there is a real move. And, and so there's a demand, and that demand is now being met. And that's, there is a balance. You know, if you don't have demand, no one's going to provide it equally. If it's not provided or not capable, you know, how will you know how good the demand is? So it's good to see that. But we need to make that process easier and simpler so that it is an attractive option for people to buy because it is costly, as Mike said, and there's reasons behind those costs. And someone has to pay for the investment in um, open space because to create communities, particularly in redeveloped areas, you do need to provide quality open green space that's often harder to provide in a redeveloped area than it is 
in a, in a greenfield space. I do think greenfield, although it gets a bad rap, you can do good intense development in greenfield and make really uh, efficient use of the space that you are taking up. Because like I, as a food producer and someone who lives on the land, I am no great fan of utilising highly productive land. But there are a whole lot of criteria that need to go into where we build houses. Um, the connection to existing communities, hazard management, as it turns out, you know, just building on the so staying away from floodplains and the coast is one thing, but as we now find out, living on the hills isn't all it's cracked up to be in certain events either. So there is a huge balance, making the processes easier and simpler, managing the costs and providing incentives for smaller homes, like reducing development contributions as we have, removing development contributions for community housing providers. Uh, all of those things go to make up part of a package that is going to be essential and I know that some people are disappointed there's only 50% of the future development planned, but even that is going to be a challenge to actually implement. So everything we can do to make that as attractive as possible is what we need to work on. Thanks very much. Uh, so Richard, uh, what would you do? Give us a specific action you would undertake. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it starts at the bottom, David. We can't start at the top. We have to start at the bottom with the basic foundation stones of our economy and our society and our ecological circumstances. And I've just put a little acronym in the, in the chat there. Um, it forms the word script, but you know, coming from a heavy aviation background and you know, I'm a great fan of uh, Buckminster Fuller, who has a fascinating book that I have at home called Spaceship Earth. And that is what we are operating here. And if we're gonna operate that spaceship successfully, then we have to respect all the operating parameters that are physically manifested upon that entity. And uh, the script stands for stress, climate, resources, inequality, pollution, and technological unemployment. And if we don't comply with those parameters as the operator of large airplanes, then you end up in a very steep place, which is right where we are. So whatever we do with these individual one by one problems has to fit in the parameters and as I said, after 10 years of investigation and research, the only system that will fix all of them, and they need all to be fixed, we can't just cherry pick whatever's popular in the press, um, the only system that will do that is a resource-based economy without business, trade, currency, marketing, etc. To be more specific, we don't want more houses. We don't need more houses. We need people living with the people that they want to be with and not forced to buy yet more expensive property. In St. Arnold, where our farm is, 80% um, of the buildings are empty. Equally in the cities, the buildings are empty. If you imagine every bank, every real estate office, every, um, most of the outlets in Queen Street and Trafalgar Street have no actual real purpose apart from processing monetary tokens, we do not need any more buildings at all. We need to be Thank you. with the people that we love. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Now, I just uh, remind everybody to have a look in the chat because there's a lot of really important comments on this question in the chat. And I do apologize for really uh, not going into them in much depth. We might come back to them. And in fact, uh, there's one person's got a link to some information from Wellington's experience, et cetera, there. But do have a look what people have mentioned in the chat. Over to you, Joanna. Okay, now we turn to, to the equally vital area of biodiversity. And our, our first question on this is, how would you use council land to increase biodiversity? And we will go to uh, Ali for the first uh, crack at this one, Ali. Um, yeah, well, obviously, uh, or, or anything that can be greened up and uh, and have and have plants planted on it that's council land is a, is a good thing. Um, and you know, wetland restoration. There's so much of that work happening down around the region right now. I think um, Tasman should be pretty proud of itself right now. Everywhere I drive, I see wetlands um, being done. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, I do do believe that that should be a voluntary thing though. I don't agree with SNAs um, and people's land being taken that they're paying mortgages on and being told what to do on it. But I think that there's a great effort by the community out there already. And a lot of farmers and property owners are making efforts in that area to, um, to, to bring up the biodiversity to plant wetlands. 
Um, I would like to see us cut back on any use of glyphosate or sprays. Um, again, there's that whole thing of sequestration of carbon uh, at, through, um, through the soil and uh, through having better quality soil but with less nitrates and, and less glyphosates on it. Um, so I'd like to see us move towards a, a more greener uh, approach with that. Thank, thank you, Ali. Next to Mike Harvey, how would you use council land to increase biodiversity? Yeah, well, the question is, I read it, said, so would you support more innovative use of the council land for conservation? And, and like, I, I prepared an answer that said, yes, I do support that. And, um, and I support anyone that would be advocating better use of uh, council land where the driving factors are founded in logic and logic, and logic can be applied. And, and in my experience, logic can be applied. And what I've found is that often it's this interpretation of legislation that's limiting our ability to make real change on the ground. So we get stuck behind this bus, this limitation of all the legislation and you know we've got people that want to do work and we've got people that have good things to do and then we're caught up waiting for all the all the paperwork you know and so I think like if we want to progress the better use and the, and the better conversion and improve the biodiversity once again I think we need to make the, the systems more user-friendly you know we've got some great systems there we just need to make things more user-friendly you know and that's the key I just want to counsel we walk in and people say how can we help rather than go away or happen. Yeah, anyway, that's my bit. Thank you, Mike. And to Tim, how would you use council land to increase biodiversity? I think there's a huge, a huge amount of opportunities um, that are either just at the beginning of being taken up or have been taken up over a number of years or will be taken up over the next. One of them is the future management of stormwater. So moving away from large pipe networks to much more multi-use spaces that utilize uh, the natural processes um, and can provide for both stormwater management, recreation, green open space and biodiversity at the same time as improving uh, the stormwater quality that we discharge into the environment. So that's one area. We have a huge area of river berms all around the district. And again, there's been a significant shift away from um, planting willows to a huge increase in the, the native plantings up and down rivers over the last five years that can that will continue to happen and again it has that multiple benefit of providing biodiversity improving water quality um, at the same time as helping to manage those river networks and that's land that we already have so that's really useful um, rabbit island wetland restoration and extension in terms of the council's forestry assets there's opportunities throughout those to do the same thing as areas are harvested um, to put back more natives barriers between waterways, et cetera. Again, multiple benefits. Um, and the, probably the biggest single one and closest to population is the opportunity behind Richmond to retire the Kingsland forest as it's harvested, put it into permanent forest species, extend the native plantings that exist in that area, which is both a great recreational resource for walking and cycling, but also an opportunity to really enhance the biodiversity outcomes in an area so close to so many people. Thank you, Tim. Richard, your views on increasing mm. biodiversity. Yeah, jolly good, Tim. That's fantastic. But of course, we won't get any cash out of that forest and we've got a dam to pay for. How are we going to balance the books if we give up all our profit making um, facilities for the good of the good of the environment? It gets tricky, doesn't it? So I've just made a couple of notes here. And, and my issue is that really this is a problem because every single human transaction is dominated by this externally controlled false value system. So we have a fantastic, you know, I've only lived in this country 20 years and I'm very grateful to be living here. I think it's the best place to live in the world actually. But we seem to have got ourselves into a bit of a pickle whereby we have five and a half million people who essentially all want the same thing. Hence, SNAs, you know, the, all the good stuff. Much of it comes to the United Nations, which is also well intentioned. But by the time you have sifted that down through a few layers of totally unnecessary bureaucracy because of money, everyone essentially having to clip their ticket to survive on the way down. And we end up with extreme inequality and a very biased result that, of course, always penalizes the most poor. As regards, using council land to increase biodiversity, 
we can do that and then some because in the voluntary society, completely voluntary society that we are proposing, there will be no need for large scale dairy farming, forestry, wine, because these are all money making entities that, that serve no good purpose to humanity whatsoever. They are just to get tokens and those tokens don't even make their way to the people or the infrastructure or the biodiversity of this country. They're just to get tokens. And they're so poorly distributed because the world is so unequal that we can't even afford four by two Sauvignon Blanc or lamb or milk products ourselves. It's that bad. Volunteers will not do that. So as regards biodiversity, we'll be giving back the majority of intensive farming countryside to the wilderness because we have no need of it in genuine spaceship Thank serious you. terms. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Over to Maxwell as on the fi final word on this question. Well, thank you very much. I suppose as I must I must point it out. There's a significant difference between what I've done and uh, talking about it and actually doing it. And I'll give you an example of my involvement in this community. I uh, was personally uh, was a chairman and developed the Rough Island Equestrian Park with uh, three other ladies from the equestrian field and, and more since then a, a committee. We had a cutover forestry, which was uh, belonged to the council. It was on council land. We, did all, we built a $3 million complex for horses and dogs at no cost to the council at all, or rate pass. We funded the complex completely on our own account from various sources. But what we did do, and this is the difference I'm saying between talking and doing, we, we buried the, uh, the uh, trees that were uh, forestry trees. We didn't burn them. We planted native trees on top of them. And every day for three years, we watered the plants with hand watering. We, we actually fenced off and developed and protected the wetlands which are associated with the park. And we planted native trees, bushes and flaxes. And if I could show you the park here, I don't know whether it's viewable, but if you see down the side here, this is all wetlands that we fenced off and protected <coughs> for the community's benefit. So we do things, or I do things with a group of other people and I support that principle. I don't just talk about it, and I'm a dear person who does things. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Maxwell. Um, now we turn to um, the participant uh, part of, of this evening, and we'll go to some of the questions. We have a lot of questions, and they cover they cover an interesting range of the, the matters that we have ra raised here. Uh, so we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. And I, I think that it would be fair to give all candidates a go at a question if they want to, uh, but without repetition. Um, so uh, let's, let's begin with this question, uh, which is from Sarah Whittle. And Sarah says, Richmond is a car-centric town with very few people living in the central business district and a vast amount of land being car parks or car yards. Would you consider putting housing mixed-use buildings into central Richmond to build community and reduce emissions? And uh, we can... Uh, I think I think I'll ask candidates to simply put up your hand if you want to have a go at that, and we because there are quite a few, um, we'll, we're going to make this one one minute. Is, is that okay, David? You can time one minute. For, I will. Yes. For the, okay. Yep. All right. So we'll start with Tim. Uh, yeah. Look, I think. Certainly, yes. I think um, the idea of being able to aggregate land or utilize what the council may already own uh, in the central part of Richmond to try and encourage and provide the opportunity um, for the market potentially to do intensification, to have a mix of both people living in the central part of Richmond um, and being able to work there uh, is something that I absolutely support in the longer term. Super. Thanks. Richard? Yep, good question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we have to really ask, you know, the deeper question, why do people want to go to town? Is it to work? Is it to go to the shops? Is it to go to the bank? Is it to buy more material goods? Is it, does it have an intrinsic purpose for the benefit of society and the planet as a whole? And I would 
proffer that most journeys are actually pointless and people don't want to make them, but they have to for some reason. But at the end of the day, again, in the voluntary society that we're proposing, we will get exactly what we want because we will be doing the work. We will be doing the planning. We will be doing the societal knock on effects it won't come from above it will come from the people that actually volunteer and people won't volunteer for things that they don't want it's as simple as that thanks thanks okay on to maxwell yes i'd, I'd support a scheme like that i think it's important to, to ask the community um I, I think we've got a lot of options there i don't think we need to have a closed book on any single like proposal like that i think it's a great idea and um, I've, I've traveled all around the world. I've seen multitudes of different situations where people live very happily in, in a small accommodation or, or as long as the service is there and, and it's hygienic, warm and things. And it's quite a, quite a vibrant uh, place you can build. And it certainly could bring, um, bring a vibrance into the uh, community in, in the city or in the Richmond route. Thank, Thank you, Maxwell. Mike? Ah, uh, you're muted, Mike. Sorry, uh, this is very consistent with uh, with my belief that we need to you know, get that short car ride out from Gladstone Road and stuff. So we have the park and ride. So like, I, I'm really, uh, I think this is a great idea and I'd love to explore this more. Thank you, Ali. Um, yeah, I think the key to actually getting property developers and I think Mike probably would agree with me on this is, um, is to make the consent easier and encourage the developers to come in and do those sort of developments. So if there was some sort of carrot from council in the way of um, consent process, if you're going to develop anything that's in a, in a town from Mortuaca or Richmond or to create inner, inner city living or small town living, if you like, um, then that sh we should be offering those developers a carrot to come do that so that they're more inclined to do those kind of developments because as uh, Mike would have pointed out, it, the consent process can be horrendously expensive and horrendously difficult. So we could make it easier and encourage them. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. Over to you, David. Uh, there's two questions from Golden Bay. So I'm going to ask the first, because it re relates to, well to one of our questions we didn't have time for. Uh, one of our questions relates to, to coastal inundation. You know, the fact is, uh, we're going to have more severe storms. We're going to have sea level rise. And in parts, our land is actually sinking a little. Anyway, the question from Liz is, uh, once you're mayor, how will you deal with coastal development that houses are still being built near the sea right now? This is what uh, Liz can see from Golden Bay. And um, I'm going to uh, start with Mike again, I think. Okay, yeah, well, uh, talking about development in general, I, I made some notes on this one because this is one that's close to my heart. And um, and I started by saying, to answer this, I'm going to apply looking at the front windscreen. So I'm looking at the front windscreen is that, that big and the rear vision mirror is that big. So I don't want to look at what the council's done to date. I'm only looking forward. And I think to look forward, TDC needs to open its eyes and start looking past the pile of easy money that is greenfield developments. You know, and, and I support greenfield developments. I support what Kim, uh, Tim said before. You can do them creatively. You can do them well. And there is a need for them, right? You, there's simply not enough infill land to meet the demand. And that's just the reality. Where do you think that infill came from? It's the growth of the region in the first place. So it's a natural expansion, but we need to use that central infill land and balance that with less greenfield. And so they need to stop looking past the pile of money and to be more specific to your question about building in a coastal inundation zone, I think it's ludicrous, personally. Absolutely ludicrous. I cannot I cannot get my head around it, you know? We saw what happened in Christchurch. And all, it's going to do, okay, all it's going to do is cost ratepayers and um, people that pay tax, which is all of us, in the long term. Time's up. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Well, let's comment on that next. Coastal developments, Tim. Yeah, look, I think it depends on exactly what you're meaning. So uh, for, there are locations, one-off existing um, titles around coastal areas and rural particularly, where as long as people understand the risks and they build things that are relocatable on piles and they understand when they build that they may well have to move that at some point in the future, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. When it comes to development in the sense of 
creating new actual like um, communities, then that's a completely different uh, And the council currently through both the FDS and most of its other planning documents has uh, excluded development on land below the five meter contour. So I think that's quite an effective starting point, but I still believe that doesn't mean you can't build anything anywhere close to the coast. There are certainly ways of building um, and I'm sure people will still want to enjoy that environment and they may well be able to do that for another 50, 75 years in some locations. As long as they understand the risk, they're prepared to take it on and it isn't publicly funded at the point in time that they may need to retreat. The other thing is you don't want to put public infrastructure into that space because obviously at some point in the future the public's going to have to pay for that to be shifted removed or protected thank you richard's got a solution tell us what it is richard oh that's a bit presumptuous of you i don't know it's only a suggestion david <laughs> well i was in fox glacier the day before yesterday in the morning at meet the candidates events down there for westland and uh, they argued for 20 minutes the candidate, prospective candidates and uh, the, the people who came, about 40 people there, about how best to fairly charge for fresh water. This is in South Westland. It doesn't quite make sense. In fact, it is astonishing that we were arguing about a resource that is so manifestly abundant that a bunch of 12 year olds could work it out. In Tasman, one of our problems is we've got such long distances and there's such big spaces between all the occupied areas. And here we are arguing about how to divvy up land to somehow comply with this pretend system that is foisted upon us from Wellington, from London, from other places. I mean, it is honestly ridiculous. It's embarrassing. It is negligent that we have to involve this system that doesn't exist in controlling things that are real. Thanks. Townsend, thank you. Maxwell. Well, thank you for that. I, I think the, clo the coastal environment, uh, I think we need to slowly uh, retreat back from that in low lying land. I think under five meters is quite a realistic uh, viewpoint. However, I think what we need to address is that there's a large uh, group of people on the coast now, in the coastline, and it adds that complexity is that mo most of the public infrastructure is built near the coast. We experienced, of course, more extreme weathers and, uh, and recently is a very good example. However, I must say in Packerwall, which is uh, in the Golden Bay, you've got coastal erosion and you can't just uh, ignore their, their needs. There's about 20 odd houses there. Um, they applied to the council to uh, pay for their own coastal protection they had an engineer's report. They got planning uh, planning officer to put up their plans together, and they were even willing to pay for it themselves. Now, now it's getting very close to their houses, and the first piece of land in front of the their houses is reserve land. The council's reserve land. The council reserve department said, "Yes, go ahead. We'll approve of that." And you get inside the council chambers a little bit further, and the planning officer says, "No, we can't." Well, quite frankly, um, you can't avoid what is there and what is present. It'd be my view that those people should be given the opportunity to protect their, their homes, and it is their homes and their livelihood, uh, and we can't just avoid saying it's not there anymore, or we're going to retreat. Maybe in the future that's something we should look at, but currently, if, if I was the mayor, Time, I'd, give them, I'd give them permission to, to get that done. Time, thank, thanks. Thank you. So, Ali, what, you, you live on the coast. What would you do about coastal oh. developments? Uh, you know, as a counsellor. Yeah. yeah, so um, it's sort of interesting because I agree a little bit with Tim and a little bit with Max. I think there's a certain thing to be said for if you're building something relocatable that's on piles that can be lifted up and can be moved away, it's kind of good. Um, and I think that we also have to think about people's safety as well. And and I think in the interim, there is some, there is some uh, what's the word for it? Um, there is, yeah, uh, for, doing, for doing rock walls, I think we can kind of do that a little bit, but it, eventually eventually, um, anything that we do, it won't matter anyway once the sea level really comes up. Um, and I think keeping rivers, keeping waterways and ditches and stuff like that clear, we do have to, with climate change, keep people's safety, I think, at the priority. And... Rock walls around always good, like I witnessed that at Ruby Bay, where 
they built the rock wall, but they haven't used huge rocks. They used, um, you know, smaller rocks. And it just basically got picked up and thrown through the sides of people's houses like missiles um, because it wasn't big enough, you know. So I think we kind of need to look at the quality of, of what sort of um, retainers from the sea, if we're doing anything like that, we need to look at that and look at how we construct them. Thank you. So I think we'll go, Joanna, to another question, shall we? Yes, yes. I want to do another one from Golden Bay. Um, this one from Liz Thomas. What steps can council take to provide and encourage public transport to Golden Bay instead of people needing to do a 250 kilometer round trip in their car to get to Richmond? There's no bus at all at present. And uh, it would make sense, I think, to go to Tim first for this and then see what if other people want to add to that. Yeah, I think I talked to this question actually in the meeting in Golden Bay. Um, so the, the recently announced extensions to public transport out as far as Mortawaika um, and Wakefield is a big step for a region like this. So um, running public transport out into rural areas, is it's going to be very interesting to see the uptake and how it works, um, particularly given the investment in the electric buses as well at the same time. So Unfortunately, it, it seems it'll be a, a while before we extend that service out to Golden Bay. But if there's a really good uptake and it becomes really successful, the first focus will be on the frequency of trips on those existing routes. Um, I know at certain times of the year, some of the tourist bus services can be utilised by um, the general public. But yeah, I, I think it, unfortunately, it may be a while before public transport's extended as far as Golden Bay. And the same thing would apply to places like Tapawera and Murchison, who have you know, similar um, distance to travel if they want to come in and access services in town. The flip side is that is we need to continue to be investing in services to make sure that there's minimal need to travel um, those distances more often than absolutely necessary. Thank you, Tim. Richard has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Again, you know, in this voluntary society that we're promoting, then the people, if it is necessary to have transport, then they will provide it. But I mean, I've been a close watcher of public transport for many years, and there are so many empty buses, aren't there? It is pitiful. It's painful to watch them. It's absolute agony. And again, in the voluntary society we're talking about, with, that won't have inequality and super rich and super poor, you know, people with big flash Jaguars, they happily drive from Golden Bay into Richmond because it's great fun. If you are a poor person, maybe you spent your life giving to others or caring for your community or sharing what you have, then you won't have a flash car and you may not be able to afford to get all the way to get into town for whatever it is. So we have a system that rewards those who have done the most taking, who have done the most accumulating for themselves and penalizes those who have done the most giving. And so the whole thing is completely upside down. Thanks. Okay, Any, anyone? Oh, Ali, go ahead, and then Mike. When we had the Golden Bus, um, the Golden Bay Bus Service, I've actually used it a lot. So um, uh, when it was running, apparently it's going to get running again at some point. It's not running at the moment. Um, and I must say that I took it at all times of year, going to the airport or into Richmond or whatever, if, I, if there wasn't someone else I knew that was going that way. And um, I hardly ever saw it empty actually, and all the times I've used it, and I'd say I've probably taken it more 30, 40 times, and, and every time when it got to Tasman and it got to me, um, it already had a number of people on it. So I don't know. I think Golden Bay actually does have the number of people that would actually use the bus service, and I would be encouraging as mayor for that to extend as soon as we could, because it's a natural thing. If you've got Model Acre okay, um, then coming over the hill, coming to the Model Acre stop, it's going to fill up. But I hardly have ever climbed on the Golden Bay bus at Tasman and there have been more than, say, two or three seats empty. I, like, always full. So that was before, yeah. the, before the pandemic. In, in, interesting observation. Uh, anyone else want to go at that question before we move on to the next uh, did I see Maxwell's hand up? And yeah. I did see Mike. Mike first and then Maxwell. Thank you. 
Well, actually, I'm, a, I'm like Ali. I've seen that Golden Bay bus fall so many times. I don't know that I've ever not seen it fall. And I think, you know, making the comparison between Tapuera and, you know, and getting over the region, I mean, Tapuera is not even comparable to Golden Bay. We've got thousands and thousands of people over in Golden Bay. You know, it's just crazy. So um, I actually see a solution in it. You know, uh, the current council's put together the bus <laughs> system, the network that's going to come from MOP. And I think there's, uh, they're talking about putting the existing bus uh on back on, I think that residents and, and if I was me, I'd actually do this. Like you know, and I haven't even thought about it, but it just makes sense that residents over there can make a very simple application online to get a pass, and the council just pays their pass when they want to use it. So the bus company that's running it, so you know, backpackers and everybody else, they can't get it. But if you prove you're a resident, you know, you meet a couple of criteria, then you can just jump online and get it and access because you're certified. You can just access the pass and jump straight on the bus. And I think like that's actually utilising a commercial service that would be linking with Motorwaker's existing electric service and it could expedite the uptake of that service because like Ali says, there's a lot of people in Golden Bay that will use that service. And so we could support the reinstatement of the existing old diesel bus, which is great and it's not quite where we want to be environmentally, but it would solve the problem for you know for the, for the people of Golden Bay and it would connect up to the, to the uh, Motorwaker bus which in a sense would give the Golden Bay community an opportunity to prove that they would use it and to prove that the council should put it on. So I think it's, I think it's a good solution. Yeah? So, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mike. Now to Maxwell. Yes, I'd, I'd be a great supporter of encouraging that sort of service back on there. I think they're a very isolated community. I think they deserve to get some services. And I don't see much difference between uh, providing a bus to Motuaka and going over the hill for, for a little bit more distance. It, it might be a little bit more inconvenient, but I think they, they are paying good ratepayers, good people over there, and uh, they deserve to get a little bit of uh, help in some areas that they, they perhaps wouldn't, uh, other people in, in, in the bigger places would get as, as of right. I think we should help them. And I don't see any problems with uh, combining that with, uh, you could run a, even support the tourist industry, saying, well, there's a combined bus here, you can get on and go around the farewell spit or some other pro project when you get there it, it working well together i think uh, i think it's important to do it thank you very much with that i'll hand up, hand back to david battle for the next question well, probably the last i think this will be the last and i would ask uh, candidates just to be provide a very short comment on the question on significant natural areas so this is a political hot potato for working out how we can persuade landowners to uh conserve some of their land in perpetuity. And it's an issue, I think, for the whole of Tasman, really, on the bits of land, uh, often remnants, which have got uh, conservation and her natural heritage values. So uh, I'm actually going to start with Tim, because I know you have some quite some view views on this, Tim. I'd be surprised if um, not everyone has some views on this. Um, like it's a, it is a real challenge at the moment. Like, I think most landowners um, have, and the reason we still have these significant natural areas is because those landowners have protected them, often over multiple generations. And I understand their concern when someone, council or government, decides that now they need to come and draw a line around it, put a designation on it, um, because they've protected it for that time. On the other hand, there are always examples where landowners and land ownership changes and these things are at risk. So it is trying to strike a balance. I think the right. other challenge is that in those rural environments at the moment, they are facing a huge amount of other issues. You know, uh, Hawaka Ekenau in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, landscape, um, outstanding natural landscape designations, and just a plethora of other rules and regulations. And SNAs get dragged into that. And it's not that specifically, it's the combination of all of the challenges that they're facing around land ownership and that balance between um, private rights um, and community benefits. So it's something that I think you just have to continue to work with landowners, work with the range of different interested parties and stakeholders. And as a council, we've always prided ourselves on trying to achieve the outcomes that we want while working with people and not having to revert to rules and regulations. And if that's possible, that is by far my preference. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to be uh, asked uh, you, Richard, next. Uh, just a very quick comment, please, on, on this particular topic. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I'm in SNAs, and we're getting cane for them on our little farm at St. Arnold as well. 
And what really got me going, David, is when you said hot potato. As soon as there's any remnant of conflict out there, you wonder why. Everybody wants us to protect significant natural areas. What is it that drives people to harm significant natural areas? Nobody wants to smash the place up. It's pretty straightforward. Again, it all comes down to money. I'll stop there, David. Yeah. Thank you. Would any other candidate like to comment, particularly on this mic? Okay, I was over in Golden Bay the other day and I was talking to somebody who had a, um, had a piece of land uh, with a little, uh, a little hollow, is how they described it. And they said it had some, um, a few bulrushes and bits and pieces in it. And uh, the council came along and just told them that was a significant natural area and they had to fence it off and stuff. So they started doing the work. And then the council drainage department or the water department came along and said, what are you doing in that area? And they said, well, we've been told it's a significant natural area, and so we have to fence it off and sort it out. And next thing you know, the drain guy said, no, but that's the drainage system. You have to clean it out, not, not protect it. So what I want to see is I want, I want to see the right hand talking to the left hand, you know. Right. What we Thank need you. to do is tidy up the council and the communication. So that's my view. Thank you. I, I'm going to take one final comment on this, and then I think we'll probably wrap the session up. So Ali, please. you got I uh, yeah, pers personal experience um, actually in this this week. Um, my neighbour is doing some natural plantings down the back. She's got the guys in doing the plantings, and the um, and the the officer came out. The compliance officer came out and said to him, "What are you doing pulling the bulrushes out?" And he's like, "We're not. We've been pulling toy toys out." And he said, "Well, where's the bulrushes being pulled out from?" And he said, "Ah, uh, that's the council." <laughs> Rivers Department pulling them out across the road and they were spraying them and pulling them out to dig out the ditch. And then the same compliance officer looked at the ditch that actually runs across and through and out through my place. And he, and he said, oh, I said, what are you doing with this ditch? And he said, well, I'm planting around it. And I sort of said to him, well, you need to be able to clear that as well because it's actually drainage for the entire village that actually comes across the bottom of our place. And he said, the compliance officer said, oh, you know, you can't touch that. The white bait came up, come up it. And I said, oh, really? I said, did he happen to consider what's at the other end of it? There's actually a floodgate on the dockland. White bait can't come up it because when the tide comes in, it's closed shut. So um, there's a bit of left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing and lack of land knowledge in, in council with some people. Uh, uh, I, I think we're uh, nice to have these stories. And I think we've heard some great, uh, important recommendations on how we can improve the environment and take action on climate change. So I would like to thank everybody and I think Joanna, you're going to wrap up the session now. I am. Yeah, I, I do want to thank the candidates most sincerely actually. First of all, for putting themselves forward for service to the community and for wrestling with these undoubtedly difficult questions. I also want to thank you for being such a, such a polite and disciplined uh, group of people, uh, giving thought, thoughtful responses. And I, I'm sure that some of you have spent time preparing these responses. And I, I do thank you for your, your self-discipline um, during this session. Uh, I want to thank David, my co-host, and the Climate Forum team for the behind the scenes work for this session. And thanks for ta to Tasman Environmental Trust for joining this endeavor. And finally, to the Lottery Grants Community Projects Division for funding the advertising of these events. Finally, let me close with a karakia, which is one for when Together, we've done a piece of good work. The, the um, specific karakia is, we've just been paddling a waka on the sea and we've landed on the beach and we, pour, we get out and we pause to reflect on what we've done together. Ko te ha, ko te pō, ko tangaroa, ko te mana, ko te kotahitanga, O nga mata waka. Homie, huie, taikie. Thank you, everyone. And good night to everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Well done. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.